Well, regular followers of telecommunications policy will recognize our guest this week on The Communicators, Blair Levin, former FCC chief of staff, former broadband plan executive director, now at the Aspen Institute. Mr. Levin, thank you for coming back to The Communicators. Thank you very much. Also joining us is Eliza Krigman of Politico. She's a technology reporter there. If I could start, Mr. Levin, it's been about a year since the national broadband plan, which you mm -hmm. spearheaded. Uh, was introduced to the country. Mm -hmm. Give us your assessment of the past year and its progress. Well, first, I think you have to understand what the plan really was. And what the plan was, was an agenda setting and target clarifying device. That is to say, it was supposed to say, here's the things that we need to do over the next few years. And also, here are targets that we either need to shoot for or shoot at. That is to say, here are some really concrete proposals to move us toward action. And I think in that way, it's been a very, very successful year. The de every debate that's going on, uh, with the exception of um, debates about mergers, are really debates uh, that are very uh, about how do we accomplish the goals of the broadband plan. And I think that in terms of agenda setting, it did prove to be a very unifying and consensus kind of document that everyone, kind of the stakeholders generally agreed the kinds of things, spectrum reform, universal service reform, rights of way reform, uh, were very important things uh, to be done. Uh, in terms of the targets that we set, you know, we're moving towards some of them. Some of them were coming up with better ideas. That's perfectly fine. Um, so uh, I, I think it's been a pretty good year. Uh, I would say that this is not like a blueprint where every element has to be exactly right or there's structural instability. It's more in the nature of um, a book to a movie. And it's a, it's a different kind of source material. And there are, you know, as many ways to implement the plan as there would be to make uh, a movie out of the book The Christmas Carol, which, by the way, the answer is at least 41, because that's how many movies have been made out of it. So I think, you know, um, two steps forward, one step back. There are some things that I'm, I just think, great. There are other things I go, really? But, you know, that's the way you would expect it to be. Where would you like to see improvements, or how would you like to see the policy different? Well, um, there are certain very important issues where I think we've gone off track on the debate. For example, on the spectrum issue, which I think is extremely important for the future of the country, not tomorrow, but over the next five to ten years, and certainly over the next twenty years, uh, I think the important issue we need to resolve is how do we constantly reallocate spectrum to serve what uh, the public needs. We've had a lot of different spectrum debates uh, about issues such as the, um, the D block for public safety, um, about repacking spectrum and things like that. But at the core, we need a plan so that as markets change and technologies change, we reallocate spectrum in a way that serves the public interest. And I think we've gotten off track of that debate. Um, and indeed, what, what's interesting is that in some ways, there's an argument being made that we don't ever need to reallocate spectrum. The most important thing we all do every day is figure out how to reallocate whatever our, our scarce resource is, whether you know, it be time or, in the case of this show, how do you allocate uh, who's going to be the guest on the show, those kinds of things. You know, When I was on Wall Street, the most important thing everyone did was to figure out how do they reallocate the capital that they have. Well, the most important asset in broadband over the next 10 years will, that the government controls will be spectrum. And we need a method to reallocate it, and we're, our, the debate is getting lost. Okay. Uh, one aspect of that reallocation is the proposed incentive auctions. Right. Do you support those? Absolutely. Basically, there are only four ways to do reallocation. The first way is to assume we got it perfect in the first allocation and therefore never need to change it. In any business, in any life, this would be considered insane. In Washington, it's actually a very respectable argument where people say, hey, you allocated it this way in the 1950s, you have to stick with it. I disagree with that. A second way is let the market determine it entirely, have no restrictions at all. That's actually not a bad argument, but uh, it's interesting. There was a letter from 112 economists who pointed out the, the many problems with that. You have to coordinate. There's international harmonization. There's equipment harmonization. There's geographic and band configuration. There needs to be a rational market for spectrum, and the government has to be that market maker. It's a deba debatable point, but I think that, that that's the better argument. The third way, interestingly, is the status quo, which is you wait for a crisis, and then the government, by administrative fiat, 
simply takes it away from whoever has it to begin with. I, I'm, you know, I'm okay with that, except that that's crisis response. It's ineffective and basically leads to years and years of litigation. What incentive auctions would do is provide a reallocation method that's market-based. That's what I'm for. So, in, in a sense, in your view, are the broadcasters sitting on underutilized capital? Well, I think some broadcasters are and some broadcasters aren't. And what's, what's interesting about the debate is that the broadcasters continue to say things that assume that all broadcasters are the same. That if we allocate spectrum to any broadcaster, it's the, we, we need to allocate it the same way to all broadcasters. We have 25 broadcasters in New York. We have 32 in Los Angeles. We, we have many others in many other cities. That was done at a time before there was cable, before there was internet. Do we really need that many? Now, I'm, I think the right answer is to let the market determine that. And what spectrum, what incentive auctions are about is letting, when, when the market changes, and changes the value of spectrum to go up, but the value of broadcasting to go down, for some, for the 25th broadcaster in New York, it may be it's more valuable to, to sell the spectrum. And we need to have a rational mechanism for doing that. Uh, but it's curious, the broadcasters seem to be of the view that any change in the system is very, very problematic. And I disagree with that. Eliza Krigman. Uh, you said that we've gotten off track on the spectrum debate. Is that because of actions that the FCC has or hasn't taken, or is that because of the debate that's going on in Congress with this? If you could flesh I that out. I think there are a lot of different reasons why. Um, you know, for example, the debate over the reallocation method was paired with the debate over public safety. Um, I understand why people did that, and that was a rational decision. I just think it's unfortunate because I think it's very important that we establish the, the right reallocation method. Um, I think the broadcasters have been very successful in taking people's eye off the ball, which is, again, what's the method that you want for reallocation? Uh, and by the way, I'd, I'd be happy to come back on the show if you ever wanted to invite Gordon Smith. I'd be happy to sit here with him, and I'd love to hear his answer to the question, how should the country reallocate spectrum over a 10, 20-year period? He's never answered that question, and I think the country deserves an answer from the broadcasters. Let me ask a follow-up. Uh, the administration and, and Congress would like to use the money from the incentive auctions to not only build the interoperable public safety network, but also to help reduce the deficit. Yes. Is there enough money for both, and how should this be parsed out? Um, well, look, the Congress will spend the money the way they, they want to spend the money. They certainly don't, uh, you know, I don't have expertise in that, nor if I did, would they listen to me anyway. But, but the more important point is, I, I've followed, I, I was involved in the first auctions. I have followed every auction as, a, as an analyst. You can make estimates about auctions, but they're very tricky. And there's so many different variables that will affect the auction, what the market conditions are at a particular point. You know, you, you had a, if you had had a spectrum auction as we did in 2007, if you'd had it a year later after the financial crisis, which has nothing to do with telecom, you'd have a very different result. So I think that uh, everyone needs to have a certain level of humility about what the projections are. They obviously are a very important tool, but the fundamental point is not about using Spectrum to raise money. It is about using Spectrum to create competitive, innovative, dynamic markets that drive economic growth and productivity. So enough money for both or not? <laughs> well, I, I, no, the truth is I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. You, you have to make an estimate, and it would be great if there was. But again, I hope that decision makers focus not so much on the I mean. The money will drive the process to some extent, but the fundamental thing again, let's make sure we have spectrum policy that drives competitive, innovative, dynamic markets. Mr. Levin, do you agree with Julius Janikowski that there is a looming spectrum crisis, especially when it comes to uh, the new tablets and smartphones, et cetera? Uh, absolutely. Um, and it's funny, we did our estimates prior to the I iPad coming out, and if you look at the numbers on the iPad, whatever we, you know, we were way too conservative. There's no doubt that there's a looming spectrum crisis. The only question is, is it something that's going to hurt us in two years, three years, five years, seven years? Whatever, whatever number it is, we're going to need a method to reallocate spectrum. And I think it's very important that we put this front and center on the nation's agenda today, because if they were to pass incentive authority tomorrow, it would still be a number of years before that spectrum could be reallocated. This is a long-term process, so you have to start now. And if you think the spectrum crisis is going to hit, even if you think it's going to hit in five years, you've got to start today. 
some commentators have said that, well, the federal government essentially gave the spectrum to the broadcasters back in the 50s and 60s. Yes. So why should we have to buy it from them? You mean, why don't we just take it back? <laughs> well, look, actually, the law would allow that to happen. And if the government wants to do that, you know, so, so be it. I would say one could foresee a situation in which the economic consequences to our country could be so damaging, not tomorrow, but long term, um, that the government would actually be forced into a position where that would be an, an alternative. You know, if we don't have the same spectrum kind of allocated that other countries do, we are essentially, it, it would be the equivalent to having a highway system with a lot of potholes and a lot of tolls. Um, and so it's, uh, I, I, I think that the process of simply taking it back is, a, um, is, is not the most effective way to do it. Uh, but, if, but if we don't get incentive auctions, you know, that, that's the only other alternative, I think. This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest this week, Blair Levin, former chief of staff at the FCC and former FCC broadband plan executive director. He's now with the Aspen Institute. Joining us as well is Eliza Krigman of Politico. Thank you so much. Uh, and let's talk about another component of the broadband plan, universal service fund mm -hmm. reform, uh, transferring that from one that supports traditional telephone lines to broadband. The commissioners have set an aggressive deadline of putting out an order by the end of the summer. Yes. Is that possible, and how do you see this process coming along? It's possible. I don't think it's likely. Uh, but I think they should be forgiven if they miss their deadlines by a month or two. That's not, the, that's not that important. What's important is uh, that we move in the right direction. Uh, and then we move with, with some speed. Um, here's what's happening is that the industry is uh, currently negotiating among themselves and hoping to give the Commission kind of a consensus uh, document. I think that there's, you know, it's roughly 50-50 whether they'll succeed with that. Um, but I think that, uh, that, that there are a lot of things to be optimistic about and there are some that cause me some concern. The things I think that we can be optimistic about is that there's general consensus about the fact that we need to move to broadband that the old paradigm doesn't work, uh, that we need to reform both universal service and intercarrier comp, which is a very arcane system by which phone companies pay each other. Um, but I do think that we've, we've lost a little bit of the side of the fact that we really need to do this as part of a public strategy. These are essentially, we are, as we do with other things, cause a lot of people to pay so that other people can have service and when we do that, there's got to be a public purpose to it, not just a private purpose. We should not be doing it simply to prop up certain phone companies. Rather, we should be doing it because there's a public gain where we all gain because of it. And I think that some of the proposals that I've heard about and seen are really much more about uh, propping up private companies who, frankly, we've been paying a long time to, be, to act in non-economic ways, uh, and that's very disturbing. The Commission hasn't teed up the contribution side of this equation Correct. yet. Is that important to be done at the same time as the other pieces? You know, why or why not? Yeah. So there's really two sides, right? One is how do you raise money for the fund? And the second is how do you distribute uh, money for the fund? We in the broadband plan set out a 10-year plan to, to reform the system in three stages. And we said the first thing to do is to deal with the distribution. Um, and to deal with the contribution, which is how do you actually raise the funds in the second phase. The reason I think that it's important to do it that way is, first of all, there are tremendous gains to the country to be made by rationalizing the distribution. There's a lot of money that simply is not going to a, an efficient public purpose anymore. We need to change that right away. And in fact, some changes have already been done, uh, which I think is good. If you try to do both simultaneously, I think you get gridlock, and I think nothing happens. I think. You know, there, there's time to do the, the change in the contribution, but first let's make sure that the money that we're spending, we're spending toward that public purpose. On to a current events topic. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Baker surprised many by deciding to leave her post yeah. at the agency and take a lobbying gig at Comcast. Did you see this coming? Did it surprise you? It did surprise me. And do you think there's anything ethically incorrect about it? Well, uh, look, a anytime you know a person, you kind of tend to view it through the eyes of knowing the person. Uh, commissioner Baker was a wonderful commissioner. I worked with her a lot on the plan. She was really good on spectrum issues, very, very smart, um, knew the landscape extremely well, made an enormous contribution, uh, and I'm very, very grateful to that. And I think she's made a contribution in other ways, often very quietly. 
I am quite certain that she did not break any law. I'm quite certain that she, this th this offer came to her after the merger um, uh, was was raised was was already approved. Um, but I completely understand why the public feels the way they apparently do about it, and uh, and I think that there's. Look, there's a very simple answer to this that she shouldn't be held accountable for, but I hope that we, we learn a lesson here, and that's simply this. No one who's a Senate-confirmed uh, person at that agency should interview for any private sector job while they're there. They should make a commitment that, you know, it's one thing if the president says, I want to move you from the commission to something else, or if a nonprofit comes along, so there's no obvious no financial interest. But if you go there and the Senate confirms you to be a decision maker, Go there and be a decision maker. And when you want to leave, leave. And then take some time off, enjoy the family, and then start looking for a job. I think that if we just had that simple rule that nobody interviews for a private sector job while a sitting commissioner, we just be, it would be better off. So you agree with Free Press then, which sent a letter to the agency today asking the remaining four commissioners to publicly pledge that they wouldn't consider taking a job at AT&T or T-Mobile now that they're reviewing uh, their merger. Well, I have to see the letter. Uh, I would certainly say that I agree with the sentiment that I'd actually go farther and say they shouldn't interview for any private sector job that has anything to do with telecom or any regulated entity while they're, uh, while they're serving at the commission. They should wait until they leave to do that. Um, the, my only concern about the letter is I, I don't know that you want a lifelong ban um, for working for those entities or some, something like that. But uh, in some ways, I would go further than they would. Blair Levin, uh, just to follow up on Eliza's question, what about the ATT T Mobile merger? Should it go through as you've seen it? <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of people have asked me that, and I have remained very quiet on that. I, I should explain why. First of all, uh, mergers are very fact specific. Uh, I, I learned this both at the FCC and also even when I was practicing law. And unless you're really willing to dive into the details, um, which require far more, a lot more reading than I'm willing to do about the merger, I don't really don't think that someone like me should opine on it. I mean, I, you know, I just the uh, Sprint just filed the 377-page um, uh, document. Uh, I will confess I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. Uh, also, because of my uh, role with the broadband plan, I'm hesitant to say something which could be interpreted in various ways relating to the plan and relating to the merger that I, I didn't intend because it's just not what I'm working on these days. I, I will say analytically, it's been interesting to me the extent to which AT&T has premised uh, some of the merger on the broadband plan, which I find uh, interesting. I do think it represents that people recognize that the goals of the plan were good goals. But I would also say that at the end of the day, that's about, what, they're making an argument to the FCC, but the merger, and I think your viewers understand this, will, the question of whether or not that merger goes through will be fundamentally decided at the Department of Justice. And they're going to look less at those issues about, you know, what's the impact on universal service and build out, and more on the issue of competition. And that's the way it should be. The real question is a competition issue. The DOJ has very competent people. They'll figure it out far better than I could. On its face, on the competition side, just looking at it on its face, does it strike you as okay for competition or? Well, you're asking me the same question you just I, asked me, which kind I Kind of to in avoid, a different way, you're right. But I'm going to avoid it again and say that, look, I, I, if, if I studied it, I might have an answer. But that, I, I, I have a lot of respect for antitrust economists and lawyers. Um, they're kind of like the neurosurgeons of that part of the practice and uh, extremely smart and know a lot of stuff that I don't. So I'm just going to decline to, to decline to answer. Eliza Craig. Let's approach this from another angle. <laughs> I know you're excited about this question. Yeah. AT&T is selling this deal um, as good for the public because they're committing to bring wireless connectivity to 97% right. of the country. Right. Critics are concerned they're not going to follow up. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the FCC's track record for enforcing merger conditions? Uh, that's a great question. You know, there are certain things where um, I, I haven't studied that as an academic, which, and, it, and it is an interesting question. When I look back on my own time at the FCC, uh, I, I would absolutely say this, that we, we had certain merger conditions and stuff. The best stuff we did had to do with market structure and had to do with competition. That what we did, we made a series of decisions uh, in the 93, 90, well actually 94, 95 time frame uh, that Reed Hunt recently made a speech about. There were five critical decisions about wireless that I think um, a few of them were absolutely great. A few of them, you know, we would look at and say, 
maybe they were great, maybe not so much, but, but uh, fundamentally laid the foundation for a very competitive, very dynamic, very innovative uh, wireless market that, that we've really enjoyed the fruits of in this country. Um, and I think that you know, making sure that there is a competitive market is far more important than uh, whatever conditions you could put on that you then have to enforce. Now, AT&T would make the argument that there is sufficient competition. So, and I, I'm, I'm not opining on that question. I'm just saying that if you are depending on enforcement actions, it's a much tougher road. I do think, and I think it was very interesting that Verizon picked up on this, that one of the concerns you'd have about uh, a merger would be, does that inevitably lead to the need for more regulation? And I think that's one of the questions that the Department of Justice will grapple with. Uh, but when, when Reed and I got to the FCC uh, my first time, uh, we had essentially a regulated duopoly. And it really wasn't working for the country. And uh, a lot of things went into changing that, but it worked much better when we actually had a deregulated competitive market, and I hope we keep that. If you won't give us an answer on whether the deal should go through, maybe you'll tell us if you would like to be the next commissioner at the FCC. The next commissioner? Yes. Uh, I, um, I'm, I'm working on some stuff now that I think uh, is actually would be more fun than being the next commissioner. Um, I think Commissioner Baker's uh, leaving actually kind of does a funny thing to what happens to her seat, what happens to the cop seat. Uh, I think that uh, there are some great people who could go there, and I think... Uh, I prefer to keep working on some of the stuff that I'm working on at Aspen. I think that's, that's more important for me right now. And Blair Levin, you said at the beginning that you thought that the National Broadband Plan was successful in some areas, not so successful in other areas. Overall, in your view, was it far-reaching enough? Well, first of all, I was think it was successful in all enough? areas. I think the implementation, implementation uh, you know, yes. there have been two steps forward, one step back. And, and there's a variety of different factors. Look, I, I, the best single line in the plan was, uh, this plan is in beta and always will be. And I deeply believe that. We, we moved a lot very quickly. Uh, and I think that uh, it was certainly in the sense of a, a new agenda for spectrum reform, very, very good. For universal reform, I think we've moved the ball forward uh, dramatically for rights of way reform. There's also a number of other things that I think people haven't noticed in education, for example. Um, we were aligned, and we were not unique in this, but we were very much aligned with what the Department of Education is doing. If you look at their technology plan, it's very similar to, to ours. If you look at the new consumer finance agency, uh, they are taking a number of lessons that we talked about in the civic engagement section about how an agency can interact with the public. Um, I think there are some other things, you know, uh, something that got n not that much attention, but I think is actually quite profound. There's a proposal we had called the Unified Community Anchor Network um, uh, proposal, which is how do you get next generation high-speed networks into every community, not to every home, but into every community through anchor institutions. That's something that's not gotten a lot of publicity, but I think is moving along very, very well. I, I think it was visionary enough, but I have to say I, I react a little bit negatively to the to the desire to be visionary because there were a lot of people who wanted us to be visionary without any relationship to mathematics, by which I mean money, or to effectiveness. So people said, you should be more visionary. You should say, we should do what Korea does and have a gigabit in every home. That's actually not that smart a policy. And certainly, uh, I mean, it may be smart for Korea, which has a different market structure and a different population density. But for the United States, it would be incredibly costly, and I'm not sure much gain. Uh, so. You know, I think we, it was a pragmatic document, a thoughtful document. I think it, it sets out an agenda. I'll, I'll let history decide whether it was visionary enough. You said it was. Uh, it's always going to be in beta. And right, that's right. important to remember. Right. We've and, and, I, and by the way, you know, I, I gave a speech on the one-year anniversary about what I thought was uh, my personal biggest mistake. I think what we did on the adoption side was thoughtful and very good in a lot of ways. But as I studied it over the, over the year that I was at Aspen, I began to realize that wasn't visionary enough, and we needed a really a new, fresh approach, and I, I laid it out in a speech. Back in beta, mm -hmm. it's in, always in beta, we've talked about some technologies and policies that are, were set years ago. Right. Uh, you were chief of staff at the FCC during the 1996 Telecom Act. Yes. How do you rewrite that? <laughs> oh, you know, to, the, to bring it well, up to it, date, to bring it up to 2011. Uh, 
2012. Well, you could rewrite the law, though. The, the problem with rewriting the law is, remember, the 96 Act, I think the first draft of that was 1973. Okay? So the, you don't want to freeze things by depending on a change in the law. If we could all get in a room and rewrite the law in two weeks, hey, I'm, you know, I'd, I'd love to do it. I'd love to sit there. But that's not the way lawmaking works. So um, uh, I, I think we as a country, there's a lot of discrete things that we need to do to, to move forward. There are many interesting things about the 96 Act. I actually think in some ways it was uh, an untold success story. I know this would be a controversial notion. But one reason why we actually, you know, McKinsey just came out with a study about um, uh, the Internet and its effect on economic development, it would surprise some people about how well the United States does there. But the there are some fundamental reasons. Um, one of them is research institutions, that we just have human capital that knows how to use this stuff, which leads to us being the leaders in a lot of applications, which is real, which are real important. The 96 Act actually, in an interesting way, led to a lot of buildup of infrastructure, which it was turns out to be really important, too. But the fundamental mission of the 96 Act was to allow long distance into local and local into long distance. And I think we all would look back in history and say, turns out that wasn't the biggest, uh, most important issue from an historical perspective. That was one that kind of its roots lay, you know, many years earlier in the breakup of AT&T. And that's, again, you know, it's why we need to be humble about how we approach these things and about grand designs and great visions. Um, I think we can see a need for spectrum reallocation. I think we can see easily we need to transform education dramatically. I mean, the iPad and the tablets create incredible opportunities to improve the way kids learn. And you're actually seeing that in some schools, and hopefully we'll see it nationally. Incredible opportunities to change the way we do healthcare. Incredible opportunities to change the way we do public safety and, and job training. We, we need to focus on those things. Eliza Krigman. Let's talk about another law where some people would like to see a rewrite, carriage mm. fee negotiations for the, the cable industry. Yeah. They keep saying that you know, broadcasters have an unfair advantage and the 92 Act needs to be rewritten. What's your take? Well, it's always interesting uh, on these things. Uh, you know, my take is that th this is a fundamentally an economic battle uh, between two industries over how you divide an, an economic pie. Uh, my guess is that um, uh, the most critical thing is not what is being debated. And that, well, here's what I mean by that. Right now, the debate is what is the nature of the law? In a very important piece that the firm uh, uh, Sanford Bernstein just put out, on the impact of poverty on the telecommunications sector. It's pointing out that we are now, because of what's going on in our greater economy, we're reaching a point where a huge proportion of the population is not really going to be able to afford um, uh, uh, the, the, the kinds of things that we think of as being almost essential. And this, if I was in the industry, this would be my biggest concern. The problem with the, re, the way retrans has gone is that it constantly has raised um, the rates for multi-channel video. And, you know, the cable guys blame the broadcasters and the broadcasters blame the cable guys. I'm not opining on either one. I'm just saying that the, the entry price is going to be out of reach for most Americans. And so there will have to be a change. I have a feeling that change is going to be driven by economics, not by change in law. It's either going to be driven by the economics of everyone finally realizing you can't start at 100 bucks a month uh, or whatever the starting point is. And that, that number is probably a little high, but it's still, whatever the number is, it's too high for, for tens of millions of Americans. Or it could be changed through things like Netflix, um, over the top video. So that's where I think that, that debate is going to go. Eliza Krigman, we have time for one more question. Okay. Do you see, following up to that, over-the-top video as a complement or a substitute to traditional cable um, and satellite right service? Right now it's clearly a complement. There's no question about it. The question is what happens in the longer run. When I got to the FCC, wireless was a complement. It was not a substitute. Now it's a substitute product. There's a lot of different things. Uh, I, I think those are funda that'll fundamentally be driven by economic decisions. I think by the producers, that is the, the content creators, the, the studios, as to how uh, they could end up cannibalizing some existing revenues. But if they don't cannibalize their own, someone else might cannibalize it for them. So that's the challenge. Blair Levin, thank you for being on The Communicators, much, giving us an update on your views on several issues. We look forward to having you back. Eliza thank Krigman, you. Politico, as always, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.